The United States is finally turning the corner. More and more states have legalized marijuana, and even the federal government is beginning to take steps toward legalization. But why was marijuana banned in the first place? In 2012, the states of Colorado and Washington became the first states in the United States to legalize recreational marijuana, a move that started a trend that has gained momentum throughout the country. As of February 2022, 18 states, along with Washington, D.C. and Guam, have legalized recreational use of the drug. Currently, the U.S. Senate is making moves to finally put an end to the federal pot prohibition as well. Many studies indicate that marijuana is nowhere near as dangerous as drugs that are generally legal and easily available, such as alcohol and tobacco. Yet, reefer is classified by the federal government as a Schedule I drug. That's a class of the supposedly most dangerous banned substances with no acceptable medical uses, such as heroin and LSD. Interestingly, cocaine and meth are Schedule II drugs, categorically safer than marijuana, according to the United States Drug Enforcement Agency. So with more and more dispensaries popping up across the country each year and the culture of smoking weed becoming more normalized, lots of folks might be asking how and why this plant was made illegal in the first place. Up until the end of the 19th century, Americans were encouraged to cultivate cannabis, or as it's otherwise known, hemp. Though hemp and marijuana both come from the cannabis plant, hemp is bred to have a much lower concentration of THC, the chemical in pot that gets you high. It was used to make clothing, rope, and other products. Virginia farmers were required to grow it in the 17th century, and several colonies used it as legal tender. Hemp plantations were widespread throughout Mississippi, Georgia, California, South Carolina, Nebraska, New York, and Kentucky. Toward the end of the 19th century, cotton replaced hemp as the material of choice for clothing. Instead, hemp became a popular ingredient in medicines, and you can find it in just about any pharmacy in the country. At the same time, the recreational use of hashish spread from the salons of France to some quarters of the United States. Americans didn't have a problem with marijuana until migrant workers from Mexico began coming to states like Louisiana and Texas at the beginning of the 20th century. Americans grew antagonistic toward these immigrants, despite taking advantage of their labor. The Mexican workers called the plant by its Spanish name, marijuana. Even though most Americans had the drug in their medicine cabinets, usually listed as cannabis, the plant became newly exotic and something to fear. By 1931, 29 states had banned marijuana, and the United States had created the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, the forebearer of the DEA. Meanwhile, black jazz musicians began to adopt the drug as part of the Hepcat lifestyle. Marijuana was even immortalized in song lyrics, such as the Cab Calloway hit, Reefer Man. Though the prohibition on alcohol ended at this time, cannabis' recreational popularity among people of color made it an easy target. Unfounded and racist claims that weed made men of color violent and overtly sexual toward white women were present in hearings on marijuana in the 1930s. The sale and use of the plants were made illegal by the Marijuana Tax Act of 1937. Its place in the Schedule I category was established by the Controlled Substances Act in 1971. But even after the drug was made illegal, its place in the culture continued to grow and become normalized, particularly during the counterculture of the 1960s. By the following decade, 11 states had decriminalized weed, and even the Nixon-appointed Schaefer Commission recommended decriminalizing the drug federally. President Nixon ignored the recommendation, though President Carter openly supported nationwide decriminalization. At the very least, mandatory minimum sentences for drug possession were relaxed. But in 1986, President Reagan signed the Anti-Drug Abuse Act, reinstating minimum sentencing for drug offenses. Marijuana was not granted much leniency. Possessing 100 marijuana plants got the same penalty as possessing 100 grams of heroin. President Clinton made the penalties even harsher, tacking on a three strikes rule in his Violent Crime Control and Law Enforcement Act of 1994. Drug arrests skyrocketed. Though there have been tweaks over the years, the bulk of the law, including mandatory minimum drug sentencing, is still in place. He won't get out until he's 79 for selling something that's currently legal for recreational use in four states. And all this because of an unfounded fear of the unknown. Originating millions of years ago, cannabis has become one of the most familiar plants in the entire world. Here's how it got from humble weed to everyone's favorite, well, weed. The origin of wild cannabis sativa has been debated for years. As the 2018 study published in Cannabis and Cannabinoid Research Notes, determining when the species first evolved was complicated by the lack of fossil records. But by examining DNA mutation rates, scientists were able to deduce that the genus Cannabis evolved around 27.8 million years ago. Curiously, its closest relative is the genus Humulus, which includes the hop plant used to make beer. 
Scientists then studied tiny fossilized pollen grains for more clues on the species' evolution. Because cannabis pollen is remarkably similar to that of its cousin, Humulus, botanists used habitat to determine which was which in the fossil record. They concluded that the wild ancestor of modern cannabis sativa most likely evolved on East Asia's northeastern Tibetan plateau, in what is now China. Scientists believe that this high-elevation steppe environment gave rise to the species' famous cannabinoids, as those compounds protected the plant from both sunlight and grassland herbivores like horses and rodents. According to a 2022 study published in Perspectives in Plant Ecology, Evolution, and Systematics, the species then spread via animals and waterways, its range expanding and shrinking with glacial events. These events likely caused the species to split from Cannabis indica, considered by most botanists to be a subspecies, about 1.05 million years ago. Sadly, as a 2021 study published in Science Advances notes, marijuana's wild ancestor has likely gone extinct. People discovered the many benefits of cannabis sativa pretty quickly, though its earliest uses were practical rather than recreational. According to a 2021 study published in Science Advances, genetics indicate that modern cannabis sativa diverged from its wild ancestor around 12,000 years ago in present-day Mongolia and China, meaning this is likely where the processes of selective breeding and domestication began. Incidentally, this also makes marijuana one of the first cultivated plants. East Asia is considered a hotspot of plant domestication and is the birthplace of many modern crops, including rice rice, soybeans, apricots, broom corn, and peaches. As noted in a 2006 study published in Cell, domestication alters favorable existing traits in wild plants to better suit human needs. In the case of cannabis sativa, plants were initially bred for their oily seeds, which served as a food crop. Later, selective breeding produced taller plants full of stem fibers, which were used to make textiles like paper, rope, and cloth. According to a 2019 study published in Science Advances, the levels of psychoactive components in early cultivated cannabis sativa were low, indicating it was not yet valued as a drug plant. Sorting through history to determine how and where different varieties of the species came to be is a challenge. As a 2022 study published in Perspectives in Plant Ecology, Evolution, and Systematics notes, it's possible there were multiple domestication sites, including one in Europe between the Caspian and Black Seas. These two characteristics, strong fibers and psychoactive effects, are largely due to domestication. Though they originally cultivated it for its nutritious seeds, ancient China soon found many additional uses for cannabis sativa. Archaeologists discovered imprints of rope made from the plant pressed into old pottery, evidence that hemp was in use about 12,000 years ago. Fibers from the plant were also used to make clothing and paper, an invention that advanced Chinese culture significantly. Growing cannabis sativa also gave the Chinese an advantage in battle, as hemp bowstrings were greatly superior to the flimsier bamboo bowstrings used by rivals. Stronger and more durable hemp bowstrings allowed Chinese fighters to send their arrows sailing much further, and as a result, hemp became the country's first war crop. But as it turned out, sturdy fibers were only one of the plant's useful features. Chinese doctors first started using cannabis sativa to treat physical maladies around 6,000 years ago. A few thousand years later, in 2700 BCE, Emperor Shen Nung, known as the father of Chinese medicine, included cannabis sativa in his medical encyclopedia under the name Ma. Ma proved useful for treating several ailments, including rheumatism, constipation, gout, malaria, and oddly enough, absent-mindedness. Later, a concoction of cannabis resins mixed with wine was administered to patients during major surgeries as a primitive anesthetic. Chinese farmers were also the first to recognize that female cannabis sativa plants produced more of these coveted useful medicines. Figuring out exactly when people first started smoking cannabis sativa for its psychoactive properties has baffled historians for ages. Luckily, recent findings have shed some light on the matter. According to a 2019 study published in Science Advances, researchers discovered evidence of burned cannabis within 10 braziers, basically mini barbecues, found within eight tombs at the 2,500-year-old Jerzankel Cemetery in modern Tajikistan's Premier Mountains. What's more, the plant residue found in the braziers contained more of the psychoactive compound THC than typical wild cannabis sativa of the time, indicating it had possibly been selectively bred for its mind-altering effects. Researchers also observed the link between the cemetery's artifact and the writings of the Greek historian Herodotus in his book The Histories, published around the same time, which described how ancient Caspian steppe people burned cannabis using hot stones while sitting within enclosed tents. Such a setup combined with high THC content would certainly produce a pretty noticeable high. In the case of the Jerzankel Cemetery scene, researchers concluded that cannabis was smoked during the burial, suggesting it was possibly part of a ritual designed to invoke an altered state to communicate with deities, or the dead themselves. Because some of the tombs belonged to common people, researchers believe that the findings demonstrate that using cannabis to get high was no longer an activity reserved for society's elite. As past records implied, it had become mainstream. 
For one reason or another, cannabis sativa proved to be a useful plant, and people started trading it as soon as it was domesticated. Nomadic people first moved the species outside of modern-day China and the Caucasus region, two areas where it was widely cultivated starting around 10,000 years ago. As noted in a 2014 study published in Geographical Review, wandering tribes like the Phrygians and Scythians frequently traveled the Silk Road, carrying the plant with them. The Scythians especially enjoyed cannabis, cultivating it, smoking it regularly during rituals, and trading it with anyone they met. In his book, The Histories, Herodotus described their enjoyment. They take some hemp seed, creep into the tent, and throw the seed onto the hot stones. At once, it begins to smoke, giving off a vapor unsurpassed by any vapor bath one could find in Greece. The Scythians enjoy it so much that they howl with pleasure. By way of their far-reaching travels, the Scythians brought cannabis sativa to Eastern Europe, South Asia, and the Middle East. Starting around 2,000 years ago, the drug variety of cannabis sativa spread spread into Africa and Southeast Asia by way of the Indian and Arab empires. At the same time, hemp-use cannabis made its way to Europe. Europeans did not seem as taken with the drug, preferring to stick with wine and beer instead. Go to the Winchester, have a nice cold pint, and wait for all this to blow over. Many others also took a strong liking to cannabis sativa. In fact, the Hindus enjoyed it so much that they made it an important part of their religion. Hinduism likely began around 3,000 to 4,000 years ago in the Indus Valley of modern-day Pakistan. It's always been a melting pot of tenets and traditions rather than a conventional religion with a single founder, and one custom its believers adopted was cannabis use. Starting around 2,500 years ago, the Hindus began to pay homage to several deities, including Lakshmi, Vishnu, and Shiva. They also started consuming bang, an edible paste made from female cannabis sativa plants that can be added to a variety of foods and drinks. Bang is prized for both its psychoactive and medicinal properties and is said to reduce nausea. Bang is also the preferred food of Shiva, the main god of many Hindu sects, and even earned him the name the Lord of Bang. Ancient Hindus attributed the medicinal qualities imparted by Bang as a reflection of Shiva's approval. Likewise, health afflictions meant that Shiva or another god was displeased with a person's behavior. Fever, for example, was deemed the hot breath of the gods, and treating it required performing a ceremony and consuming cannabis as an appeal to the deities. This would often do the trick, as it just so happens that THC lowers body temperature. Another group that took to cannabis sativa was the Muslims. Islam started around 1400 years ago in what is now Saudi Arabia. According to a 1982 study published in the Bulletin of the New York Academy of Medicine, cannabis sativa first became affiliated with Islam around 1,000 years ago, when Persian and Iraqi sects at the eastern edge of the Islamic Empire got their first taste of the drug. A few centuries later, cannabis, called hashish in Arabic, was commonplace in Islamic culture. The Quran, Islam's holy book, didn't expressly forbid it as it did alcohol use, so more and more Muslims began partaking of the edible drug. The Sufis, a mystical faction of Islam, claimed that hashish brought enlightenment and a closer connection with Allah, and quickly spread the plant throughout the Middle East. Muslims also valued cannabis for its medicinal qualities, using it to stimulate appetite and relieve everything from epilepsy to pain to dandruff. Ashish became especially popular in Egypt, where it was used by the oppressed and rulers alike. However, by the 14th century, a few Egyptian leaders viewed the drug as a threat to society and made serious efforts to curb its use. Plants were burned, taxes were imposed, and users were penalized. Many Muslims also revisited the Quran, reinterpreting its text to include hashish as a forbidden substance akin to alcohol, but hashish endured. Sea travel made cannabis sativa a global phenomenon and was facilitated by the group perhaps most renowned for their maritime exploits, the Vikings. The fierce Scandinavian Vikings held sway over Europe from the 9th to 11th centuries, using their advanced nautical skills to navigate their longboats to new lands, which they would then conquer. And along their journeys, they carried a stash of weed. According to a 2014 study published in Geographical Review, cannabis sativa seeds were found aboard Viking ships in the mid-9th century over a thousand years ago. But exactly what were the seafaring barbarians doing with the plant? A 2013 study published in Scientific Reports notes that hemp fibers were especially useful for making rope and sailcloth, two things essential for sea travel. It was also used in elaborate Scandinavian wall hangings, likely because it produced better fibers than flax when grown in nitrogen-rich Nordic soil. The Vikings also took advantage of the plant's medicinal benefits. Vikings used cannabis to treat pain on their travels, such as that from childbirth and toothaches. To date, there is no hard evidence that the Vikings partook of the mind-altering aspects of the plant. Though in 2018, cannabis pollen was discovered at a former Viking outpost in Newfoundland, Canada, meaning they carried it farther and wider than researchers previously thought. It was only a matter of time before cannabis sativa made its way to the New World, but surprisingly, its earliest widespread introduction was strictly business. Europeans colonizing the New World were predominantly focused on using the vast expanse of undeveloped land to grow hemp to make rope, sailcloth, and other textiles for shipment overseas. As Martin A. Lee notes in his book Smoke Signals, England even passed a law requiring all American colonists to plant hemp crops starting in 1619. 
The plant flourished in the New World soil, growing much taller than it did in England, and so cannabis sativa became the first crop widely cultivated in America, its initial seeds planted by none other than the Puritans, an English religious group known for their strict moral code. Later on, George Washington even tried his hand at hemp farming. Hemp was woven into the very fabric of early America. Everything from clothing to paper to the hangman's noose was hemp-derived, and at one point the fibrous plant could be used in place of money or even as a ticket overseas. It was the nation's third largest crop until the late 1800s when steamships replaced sailboats. American hemp farming experienced one last hurrah during World War II when the need for textiles was great. Though cannabis sativa was in every American's backyard at one point, no one was smoking it. As Martin A. Lee notes in his book Smoke Signals, the drug variety of the plant first landed in Brazil in the early 1500s by way of enslaved Africans traveling with Portuguese sailors. Native South Americans, already familiar with psychoactive substances, quickly took to the drug and began smoking it during rituals. Its use soon spread across South America and into Mexico. Recreational cannabis, called marijuana in Spanish, first entered the southwestern United States alongside Mexican immigrants escaping the effects of the Mexican Revolution between 1910 and 1911. Almost immediately, the plant was viewed as a threat, and by 1931, 29 states had banned its use. A 2016 study published in UC Davis Law Review notes, apprehension surrounding the drug largely stemmed from racism against Mexican Americans and black citizens of the South. Since both groups smoked cannabis, the plant became a scapegoat for racial bias in America, with everything from rape to murder being blamed on the drug and the people who used it. In 1936, Reefer Madness, a blatant propaganda film was released, whipping the growing flames of fury into a full-blown inferno. Mate. Mate. What do you want? Bring me some reefers. Just a year later, the U.S. federal government passed the Marijuana Tax Act of 1937, which banned all non-medical use of the plant. Americans, like many cultures before them, greatly enjoyed cannabis sativa. According to a 2017 report published by the National Academies Press, marijuana use experienced a revival in the 1960s, with many young adults regularly smoking the drug. The hippie movement to the 60s likely drove marijuana's comeback, with many middle-class white American youths shirking mainstream culture, advocating for nonviolence and free love, and enjoying spirituality and recreational drug use. Marijuana use increased, peaking in the late 1970s. Though it was still federally illegal, this did little to deter its devoted enjoyers. In 1976, one in eight Americans over the age of 12 admitted to smoking it within the last month. Hippies in particular were fascinated by the newfound drug of choice and began delving into the complicated history of cannabis sativa. This led use the world over to the Middle East and India on an odyssey that became known as the Hippie Trail. On their travels, hippies retraced the ancient Silk Road on foot, rode on magic buses, and learned exotic new ways to enjoy the plant, such as smoking the concentrated cannabis resin known as hash. Famous artists of the time like the Beatles and Jimi Hendrix also got in on the fun. But the fun was short-lived. As it turned out, the plant still had its fair share of haters. According to a 2014 study published in Geographical Review, most of the marijuana in America during the 60s and 70s came from Mexico. In an attempt to stop its use, the federal government began patrolling the Mexican-American border for drugs in 1969. In 1975, they got even more aggressive with their tactics, ruthlessly spraying herbicide on Mexican marijuana crops. This caused weed prices to skyrocket. Willing to forego the drug, a generation of amateur horticulturists started growing the plant themselves, stowing miniature greenhouse operations in basements, closets, and storage units. But everything changed in the 1980s. President Reagan escalated the war on drugs in 1982, encouraging the streamlined arrest of anyone in possession of an illegal substance. But the lion's share of the policy's focus went to marijuana, while hard drugs like crack cocaine, meth, and heroin continued to infiltrate the country. This, this is crack cocaine. What's worse, the motivation for enforcement seemed to be racially motivated. Despite the prevalence of traffickers, as well as plenty of white individuals smoking pot, the majority of arrests made during the war on drugs were Latino and black youths in possession of marijuana. Meanwhile, the disproportionate focus on marijuana allowed the growing prescription opioid epidemic to continue unchecked. Throughout its history, one thing most cultures seem to agree on is that cannabis sativa is a valuable medicinal plant. The Western world was a little slow to embrace it, but one Irish doctor finally convinced European cultures to appreciate the plant. Dr. William B. O'Shaughnessy spent years studying cannabis while stationed in India in the 1830s, shadowing Ayurvedic healers and observing its various uses. Before long, he started doing his own experiments, administering cannabis to patients suffering from then incurable conditions like tetanus, cholera, and rabies. He released his findings in a British scientific journal in 1842, marking the first contemporary publication extolling the medical uses of marijuana. 
By 1854, his Indian hemp was listed in the U.S. pharmacopoeia and became regarded as something of a miracle drug. Nonetheless, medical marijuana research was later stifled by negative stigma and controversy in the 1900s. But times are changing. Modern science lists many benefits of medicinal cannabis. In addition to its psychoactive properties, THC lessens nausea, stimulates appetite, and prevents vomiting, making it an ideal treatment for cancer patients undergoing chemotherapy. CBD, meanwhile, combats inflammation, anxiety, seizures, and pain, but lacks the unwanted mind-altering side effects. In 1996, California became the first U.S. state to legalize medicinal marijuana. As of 2023, 38 states have done the same. The world is slowly relaxing its strict views on cannabis sativa use. Sections of North America, Africa, Australia, Europe, and South America not only allow medical applications of marijuana, but have decriminalized it, meaning recreational use is also permitted. Oddly enough, most of Asia and the Middle East, two regions responsible for making the world aware of cannabis, still forbid its use. The United States is currently in the process of dismantling past prejudices regarding the plant. Colorado became the first U.S. state to legalize recreational marijuana use in 2012. As of 2023, 22 U.S. states have done the same. In states where marijuana is legal, it can be grown or purchased at dispensaries. Determining which variety produces a desired effect is as easy as ordering a drink at Starbucks, and CBD products are available at most gas stations. Still, marijuana remains federally illegal and classified as a Schedule I drug, right up there with LSD and heroin, which makes it difficult for scientists to study it. But in December 2022, President Biden signed a bill to make it easier for researchers to obtain plants for their studies. As U.S. Representative and physician Andy Harris told Science, we will now be able to treat marijuana like we treat any other substance or pharmaceutical for which we hope there is a potential benefit. How does weed affect your memory? Which sea creature tastes better when it's stoned? These questions and more will be answered as we dive into the surprising truth about marijuana. It seems unlikely that a plant so useful to people just happened to evolve in just the way it did, containing a feel-good high and medical benefits all wrapped up in one neat little package. So how did it happen anyway? That's precisely what researchers from the University of Toronto were looking to figure out when they started digging through the ancient genome of a strain of hemp called Phenola and a strain of marijuana called Purple Kush. Their findings, published in the journal Genome Research, revealed a surprising truth. Marijuana plants produce THC and CBD thanks to a random set of instructions that ended up on one single cannabis genome, and it was kickstarted by a virus that scrambled the plant's DNA and multiplied massively. Researchers added that they now think that this ancient viral infection had a side effect, which was to split the genetic instructions for making THC and CBD into two separate codes. And that's not weirdly convenient enough, it's also important in the practice of engineering plants to contain one compound without the other, or ensuring the perfect ratio of the two. Seems like viruses may not be all bad all the time. Countless people choose to light up a joint at the end of a long day because it makes them feel better, and it's the same reason many people might be tempted to grab a slice of chocolate cake. Funnily enough, the two are more similar than they might seem at first glance. Way back in 1996, research for the journal Nature revealed that the brain receptors activated by marijuana were the same receptors that were activated by chocolate, just on a milder scale. Pretty straightforward, right? Fast forward to 2019 and the cannabis market is booming. Dispensaries had to figure out exactly how to label what a customer is getting in a product, including THC levels, but chocolate edibles presented a bit of a problem. Zucker Hillside Hospital Assistant Unit Chief of Psychiatry Scott Krakauer explained to Healthline that when cannabis and chocolate are combined, something happens to THC levels, but no one knows for sure what that something might be. What we do know is that the more chocolate there is in a product, the less THC shows up. What does that mean for potency? Who knows? All right, here's your brownie. <laughs> you got about 30 minutes to get someplace safe. Just imagine the thrill of welcoming a newborn bundle of joy into the world, and then experiencing the completely different thrill of finding out that your baby has tested positive for marijuana use. Would the authorities believe parents saying they had no idea what had happened? This dilemma got researchers in North Carolina involved in a weird series of events in 2012, when an extraordinarily high number of infants started testing positive for pot use. They suspected something else had to be going on, and there was. It turns out that a weirdly large number of baby products, particularly baby-friendly soap and shampoo from big companies like Aveeno contain chemicals that were found to interfere with test results, particularly cheaper test results by hospitals that wanted results as soon as possible. Even the researchers who discovered the connection aren't entirely sure what's going on. They suggested to Live Science that it's possible the soaps have a chemical structure similar to the compounds in marijuana, or that a reaction between the chemicals in the soaps and the tests caused the false positives. Either way, they stepped in quickly, noting that time was of the essence to prevent unnecessary involvement of social services. 
In 2020, the PNAS published a paper called Cannabis Increases Susceptibility to False Memory, and it describes an odd phenomenon. Researchers recruited 64 people, gave them either cannabis or a placebo, and then tested them to see how susceptible they were to agreeing to false memories when questioned about what they saw in a virtual reality simulator. They concluded that cannabis made people more susceptible to remembering things that didn't happen than people who'd gotten the placebo. Along with that came a warning. With the legalization of marijuana both medically and recreationally in a number of states, police would have more run-ins with people who were legally partaking. Have we forgotten that the use of marijuana is illegal? Well, I have, um... Glaucoma. I get nervous in crowds. Herpes. <laughs> when it came to questioning witnesses, for example, researchers argued that authorities needed to remember that asking leading questions to someone under the influence of THC could result in potentially devastating misinformation being given. Other researchers say that's not actually what's going on, that it's not a matter of false recall, but just a reflection of the tendency of people to get super agreeable while high. There's a limit, though. According to cannabis expert Dr. Mary Clifton, the reliability of memory and recall hits a point about a week later where people who were high remember it just as clearly as people who weren't. The question of whether or not lobsters feel pain has been debated for a long time, and therefore whether or not it's cruel to boil them alive is up for debate. They don't have a nervous system like humans do, but as Queen's University Belfast professor Dr. Robert Elwood pointed out to the CBC, species have evolved much differently underwater than above land. So what does that mean for cooking lobsters? Chef Charlotte Gill had an interesting take on making the transition from carefree crustacean to lobster roll a little less traumatic, and that was basically to get the lobsters high. In 2006, after a study confirmed that lobsters can be impacted by the same chemicals that make marijuana so pleasing to people, she decided to see if getting lobsters stoned before throwing them in the pot made a difference. As she told National Geographic, not only did it mellow out the lobsters, but putting a stoned lobster back in the tank with others helped everyone chill out. There was another bonus, too, as Gill described, The lobster meat actually tasted sweeter, it tasted better and lighter, and was actually more tender. The experiment was short-lived thanks to the state's health department, but Gill continued doing the same thing with a different food-safe additive. Is she onto something? Formal research in 2021 suggested that she is. Professor Sean Lockery of the Institute of Neuroscience at the University of Oregon may call it hedonic feeding, but the rest of the world knows it for what it really is, the munchies. Science has known for a while exactly what it is that gives people the munchies when they smoke pot, and it's pretty complicated. In a nutshell, THC acts on the brain in a few ways that all come together to make us crave Cheetos and pizza. In addition to releasing the hunger hormone known as ghrelin, it also heightens our sense of smell and taste, lowers inhibitions, and overrides a part of the brain that signals when we are full. In other words, it's a perfect storm for destroying the snack cabinet. It seems like that might be a pretty human-specific thing, but in 2023, Lockery published research that found that nematodes, worms so small that they're best viewed under a microscope, also got the munchies when exposed to cannabinoids. The tiny worms were put in an area with sections containing different foods, as if they were humans let loose in a cafeteria with a burger stand and a salad bar. Researchers knew that nematodes were impacted by the cannabinoids when they gorged themselves on their favorite bacteria, and just kept right on going. Hungry. 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 Is there a point to this? Surprisingly, yes. Lockery claimed that a genetic connection between the worms and cannabis may lead to additional discoveries about metabolic disorders. In 2016, media outlets like the Washington Post reported on a story that put a particular sort of person in a tizzy. It started in Hugo, Colorado, when officials warned residents not to drink the local water because tests had come back positive for THC. It was a false alarm, and those in the know weren't surprised. Why? THC isn't exactly water-soluble. Air, on the other hand, is another matter. And that brings us to Italy circa 2012. That was when the Institute of Atmospheric Pollution Research wrapped up a year-long study that looked at the psychotropic content of the air over Italy's major cities, and they discovered that a few are basically the equivalent of a college dorm on a Friday night. It's no surprise that college towns like Bologna and Florence ended up having the highest concentration of free-floating marijuana particles in the air. It's not like going to spend a weekend in either one of those cities is going to have anyone coming down with a 48-hour high. The concentration is way too low for that. However, it has been suggested that monitoring air quality for concentrations of various illicit substances could be a useful way of making connections between factors such as drug use and crime statistics, health data, or other social markers. The 2020 movie The Marijuana Conspiracy has a title that makes it seem like a fear-mongering propaganda piece along the lines of reefer madness, but it's not exactly trying to push an agenda. Instead, it's a story of five women who bond during a weird government experiment that was put together to determine what happens to the body when someone smokes pot every day. It's based on a true story, and it had some weird consequences. 
Back in 1972, the Canadian government put millions into research ahead of a proposed plan to legalize marijuana. As part of that research, 20 women were recruited and divided into two groups, one of which was given increasingly potent doses of pot every day for 98 days to see what would happen. One of those women was 21-year-old Doreen Brown, who told the Toronto Star that she was having a good time, until she wasn't. She elaborated, We were asking them to take it away. They knew we wanted it taken away, there was no doubt. I felt comatose. I couldn't do anything. It became torture. Participants described terrifying side effects like hallucinations, breathing difficulties, and feelings of loneliness made worse by their physical isolation in a Toronto hospital. Getting out wasn't the relief they thought it would be either, as many ended up in therapy to deal with their lasting feelings, mostly of fear and paranoia. The official results of the study have never been released, not even to their participants. Marijuana might have the reputation of being the substance to partake in on a lazy afternoon after a long and stressful day at work, or when it's time to kick back and relax with some old friends. In other words, when it's chill out time. But weirdly, researchers found that what's actually going on in a person's brain while they toke up is the opposite of that. In 2015, researchers from the Yale School of Medicine published a study in the journal Biological Psychiatry, saying they discovered that THC increased a specific kind of brain activity called neural noise. Neurons in the brain fire with electrical activity as they transmit information, but sometimes they fire without carrying any messages. That's neural noise, and it's like a human version of television static. The researchers found that the higher the dose, the more disruption there was. Researchers from the University of Texas at Dallas confirmed those findings in 2018. And interestingly, they stress that the increased neural noise is there even when the person in question isn't doing much of anything. Dr. Shika Prashad explained that there could be a few strange consequences, including interference with brain activity, a disruption in processes, and an increased need for concentration. Nowadays, cannabis plays a hugely important role in our society, but the plant's history is a little harder to parse. So what did 420 look like two millennia ago? Much of what we know about ancient Rome's relationship to cannabis comes from a small number of scattered texts. Any cups, bowls, or containers used to house cannabis have been long destroyed and can't be chemically analyzed. And even though cannabis shows up in ancient literature, it's never directly explained as the audience of the time wouldn't have needed such explanation. Think about it. If a play written in 2023 featured a scene in which a character casually popped a couple of aspirin, would that character go on a detailed diatribe about aspirin's function, purpose, creation, and role in society? Almost certainly not. And yet, many aspects of Roman cannabis usage will be strangely familiar to us today. The first documented use of marijuana was in 2800 BCE in China, before the plant traveled through India, the Middle East, Greece, and Rome. It was commonly used to treat arthritis, asthma, depression, pain, and other medical conditions. By the first century, the Romans knew it enough to distinguish between wild and domesticated cannabis, that is, marijuana and hemp. During this period, people around the world would have pressed cannabis to make hash or resin, passed water through it like tea, or thrown the psychoactive strain over heat and inhaled it. Ah, oh, man. That's some heavy shit. Cannabis found its way into Roman society in part through medicine, and much of that medical knowledge came from Greece. In fact, it's impossible to talk about cannabis in ancient Rome without talking about Greece. Our most methodical and thorough source of information comes from the Greek physician Pedanius Dioscorides, who in 77 CE compiled his five-volume tome, De Materia Medica, which translates to On Medical Matters. This text catalogs the descriptions and medical applications of 600 herbs, roots, stems, fruits, vines, and animal products in great detail. He says that opium, for instance, makes for a good anesthetic during surgery. Dioscorides separates cannabis into Cannabis Ameros and Cannabis Agria. Dioscorides says that Cannabis Ameros acts as birth control and reduces earaches if eaten. When boiled and topically applied, Cannabis Agria reduces inflammation and fluid retention and disperses hardened matter around the joints. That is, it helps with arthritis. Around the same time, Roman author and naturalist Pliny the Elder echoed Dioscorides in his 37-book-long natural history, although he was far less precise about the subject. Pliny writes that eating cannabis seeds, quote, makes the genitals impotent, and eating its root when boiled eases cramped joints, while its juice regulates the bowels of animals. Pliny also claims the juice of the plant drives out of the ears the worms and of any other creature that has entered them which might refer to treating earaches. 
Even though hemp bags, shoes, and clothing might be more of an ecological fashion statement nowadays than anything else, it seems that the ever-practical Romans valued the practical uses of cannabis above its medical uses. Our modern idea of hemp is that of cannabis with a tetrahydrocannabinol content of 0.3% or less, but this definition didn't exist in ancient Rome or Greece. Nevertheless, in the ancient world, certain cannabis plants were considered to be particularly useful for textiles and related products. In Natural History, Pliny the Elder describes three qualities of cannabis separated by region, which need to be dried, cleaned, and peeled before being used to make different products. The best, he says, comes from a region called Arab Hisar and makes good hunting nets. Dioscorides similarly says that Cannabis Ameros is a plant of considerable use in this life for twisting very strong ropes. It is also believed that the Romans used cannabis for rope, boat sails, and wicker goods like baskets, clothing, and shoes. By all accounts, the ancient Romans were far less interested in recreational cannabis use than they were in making textiles. In fact, some historians have suggested that the Romans seemed oddly naive about, or disinterested in, the psychoactive properties of cannabis. That's not to say it wasn't known to the ancient world, though. The Greek comic Ephippus wrote about getting high on cannabis seeds back in the 4th century BCE. A century earlier, the Greek historian Herodotus wrote in the histories about Scythian nomads throwing cannabis on hot coals and tents and howling in their joy at the results. So why so little mention of such uses centuries later? Here we come across the same issue we alluded to before. What happened versus what was written down. Ancient Rome considered itself the most moral of nations and valued modesty, moderation, and temperance above all other virtues, especially as they related to public duties and reputation. Is it unreasonable to conclude that Romans would be unwilling to openly discuss using cannabis recreationally? And yet, in natural history, Pliny the Elder at least describes cannabis as the laughing weed. He also says it can be added to wine to make it even more intoxicating. Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? Along those lines, it's entirely possible that Roman life might have involved much more recreational cannabis usage than was recorded. Roman values were based around restraint, which in a religious and political sense meant intense conservatism and suspicion of change. Top to bottom, Roman life was steeped in ancestor worship, gods and rites of the home, daily offerings and prayers, ceremonial magic, nature worship, the religion of the state, and so on. In other words, if the Romans were going to adopt cannabis use in any kind of pervasive religious sense, its use would have had to be deeply involved in the foundations of Roman religion, or else be heavily justified in practice. This means that Romans most likely didn't use cannabis directly in religious ceremonies, but in more fuzzy, religion-adjacent areas. That said, it was occasionally seen as a symbolic plant. In the 3rd century CE, Roman dream interpreter Artemidorus mentioned the significance of seeing cannabis fiber in a dream versus seeing a cannabis flower. Nevertheless, while some have speculated that cannabis played an important part in Roman religious rites, there's no real evidence to substantiate such claims, especially when it came to mainstream religion. Quitting weed isn't as painful as dropping alcohol or opiates, but marijuana withdrawal can still be a difficult process. Here's what happens to your body and mind when you decide to put away the bong for good. After Colorado and Washington blazed the trail by legalizing recreational marijuana in 2012, it was only a matter of time before other states started to join in the fun. As of 2023, recreational use is legal in 24 states and DC, with even more states offering options for medical patients. Of course, it's still illegal at the federal level. In 2022, 22% of Americans 12 and older reported having used marijuana, according to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, making it the most commonly used illicit drug in the nation. Of course, not everyone who smokes or otherwise ingests marijuana products keeps doing it forever. If you stop smoking marijuana after you have been using it for a long time, you can expect to feel some mild, uncomfortable withdrawal symptoms, but they aren't life-threatening or even temporarily debilitating, the way quitting other substances can be. Some symptoms of marijuana withdrawal include restlessness, weight loss due to decreased appetite, headaches, and even mental health effects like irritability, depression, and anxiety. Insomnia and weird dreams may also come into play, but those symptoms are temporary and make way for positive effects like increased motivation and lung health. I haven't quit smoking pot. Yeah. 
I don't even really want it anymore. It's like I totally clean myself up. What is classed as long-term marijuana use varies. But generally, using weed daily or near daily for some time would make you fall into the long-term use category. Among those in this category, a report published by JAMA Psychiatry in 2015 found that 3 in 10 people developed a marijuana use disorder. People who fall under the chronic use category may experience unwanted side effects like anxiety, moodiness, and lack of motivation, but those symptoms will generally go away after a few weeks of abstaining. However, in extreme cases, there may be more permanent changes to the brain, according to Integris Health. Marijuana use disorder is when using marijuana becomes addictive to a person and they find themselves unable to stop even if it has a detrimental effect on their life. A key sign of this disorder is the need for stronger and stronger marijuana in order to get high. If you decide to stop using marijuana as a result of developing a marijuana use disorder, your body is highly likely to face some unpleasant symptoms as it gets used to being without the drug that it's been dependent on. While the majority of marijuana withdrawal symptoms are more unpleasant than dangerous, they can still be difficult to deal with, like severe cravings for weed or negative changes to your mental health. People with mental health diagnoses such as PTSD and personality, anxiety, or mood disorders may have a harder time with withdrawal symptoms, according to American Addiction Centers. Because of this, it's never a bad idea to contact an addiction center or a substance use specialist to ensure that the withdrawal process is as painless as possible. If you don't feel comfortable with that type of help, you should at least tell supportive family or friends about your decisions so they can monitor your health and help you through the more unpleasant side effects. Those who stop using marijuana after long-term use or as a result of marijuana use disorder can expect withdrawal symptoms to kick in one to two days after they last used the drug. The next stage occurs within two to six days, during which time the symptoms will grow in severity. However, the good news is that, in three weeks, the majority of symptoms will disappear, although the exact length of time will vary from person to person. The even better news is that on the other side of the withdrawal symptoms, people who stop using weed may find they can focus better, their memories are improved, they have more energy, and enjoy a more stable mood, according to Midwest Recovery Centers. Naturally, their cardiovascular and respiratory systems will thank them as well. Marijuana has had a complex history in the United States, dating all the way back to the country's earliest settlements. Before jumping into the legality of marijuana specifically, it is worth highlighting America's drug policies leading up to the narcotics bans enacted in the early 20th century. Before these restrictions came to be, many banned substances were unavailable or widely unused. However, that period came to an end, first with the introduction of opium and its derivatives, heroin and morphine, followed by cocaine, marijuana, and amphetamines. According to PBS, Americans have used drugs since the colonial era. In the 19th century, marijuana was widely available in pharmacies, and no one seriously questioned its medical utility. According to The Lancet, in addition to use on the battlefield, morphine and its cousin heroin were also used as child cough suppressants. Medical societies even advertised heroin as a safer, less addictive morphine alternative. People using drugs was something that was just ordinarily accepted. Meanwhile, German doctors noticed that soldiers who used cocaine suffered less fatigue. And it didn't take long for that same powdery substance to be repurposed for recreational use by wine manufacturers and film crews. With the ubiquity of drugs, addiction rates skyrocketed, particularly among women in both America and Europe. As this issue persisted, a handful of governments entered into a compact to regulate the drug trade, according to the Office of Justice Programs. Congress embraced this mission by enacting the 1914 Harrison Narcotics Tax Act, which forbade unregistered parties from producing, importing, or distributing cocaine and certain opiates outside of medical purposes. Marijuana, unlike cocaine, heroin, or amphetamines, has been known since Jamestown, the first successful English colony on the American continent. According to PBS, hemp, the plant from which marijuana is derived, was excellent for making sails, rope, and clothing. In the antebellum South, it was a plantation cash crop. An 1862 issue of Vanity Fair even encouraged recreational use of the drug for its calming and medicinal qualities. So how did this drug become the target of stringent federal bans? There are a few different versions of the story. Some believe that the eventual banning of marijuana in 1937 was the result of newspaper tycoons like William Randolph Hearst spreading stories about marijuana use causing violence and tragedy to befall the American people. This rhetoric led 26 states to criminalize the drug before federal bans even surfaced. Marijuana, the burning weed with its roots in hell. The competing explanation is that the restriction had more to do with business than public health. 
According to the book NAFTA and Neocolonialism, petrochemical giant DuPont had just patented the synthetic fabric nylon, with considerable investment from men like Hearst and Treasury Secretary Andrew Mellon. Reportedly, hemp was a cheaper alternative to nylon, which rendered the new fabric unprofitable almost immediately. Whether the eventual restriction was enacted in the interest of public health or filling the pockets of large corporations, it's undeniable Hearst's media machine had a hand in the ban. Regardless of his real motive, Hearst began to publish stories painting cannabis in a negative light, blaming Mexican migrant laborers in particular for reportedly bringing the substance into the country. Though we may never know the whole truth behind its origins, the 1937 Marijuana Tax Act banned the drug's use recreationally, without any exceptions for medicinal use. As the Drug Policy Alliance notes, the 1970 Controlled Substances Act placed marijuana as a Schedule I drug despite its previous medicinal use. But some, such as the famous stockbroker Irvin Rosenfeld, swore that the drug kept them alive. According to Vice, Rosenfeld was diagnosed with a painful bone disorder, typically treated with high doses of strong, presumably addictive painkillers. In the ferment of the hippie-dominated college campuses of the 1970s, Rosenfeld discovered that he could control his pain more safely with marijuana claiming to be pain-free after smoking a handful of joints. He linked up with another user named Robert Randall, who had controlled his glaucoma with homegrown marijuana as well. Randall and his wife were arrested in 1975 for growing hemp and promptly sued the U.S. government on grounds of medical necessity, with the help of a UCLA study that scientifically analyzed the effects of cannabis use on glaucoma symptoms. In response, the FDA created its Compassionate IND program for marijuana, Simply put, anyone demonstrating a medical need for marijuana could apply with a doctor's sponsorship for an exemption. Their experiences would be documented in service research, while Uncle Sam sent these patients government-sanctioned joints. Although the program only approved 13 applications before it ended, activists realized medicinal use was a surefire road towards legalization. Subsequent battles over marijuana took up this issue before recreational use came to the fore. Much like the gradual ousting of marijuana from the U.S. in the mid-20th century, the initiative to nullify the federal ban on cannabis began with states working toward medicinal legalization. According to Britannica's ProCon, between 1979 and 1982, 24 states and Washington, D.C. legalized medicinal marijuana. Ten other states followed, but their new laws were either repealed or expired over time. Much of these medicinal exceptions resulted from the fact that the 1970 Controlled Substances Act allowed doctors to use illicit substances in medical and scientific research with federal approval. As a result, doctors in several states began prescribing the drug in the name of cancer and glaucoma research, while others attempted to downgrade marijuana to a Schedule II substance when used for medical purposes. And uh, what it boils down to is we ended up with, a, with no enforcement. And so that means it's like it's being legalized. While recreational and medical marijuana remain federally illegal, these acts throughout the nation paved the way for much more widespread change in the coming decades. In 1996, California became the first state in the country to enshrine medical marijuana in state law. The development came in the wake of intense national debates over the war on drugs. In the 1980s, the Reagan administration escalated the drug war with increased penalties for possession and distribution, as doctors frequently prescribed marijuana for terminally ill AIDS patients. By 1991, San Francisco had already passed Proposition P for AIDS patients to obtain the drug. Five years later, Proposition 215 made legalization statewide. According to Britannica's ProCon, Proposition 215 passed with 56% of the vote for an open nullification of federal law. From there, as Drug Policy Alliance founder Ethan Nadelman reports, the otherwise liberal Clinton administration began speaking out against the motion, strengthening Reagan's commitment to the drug war. Ultimately, Bill Clinton was rowing against the current. As ProCon notes, seven states in Washington, D.C. followed California with effective medicinal legalization by 2000. In the latter half of the 2000s, six more states legalized medicinal marijuana, including Colorado and Vermont. According to the 1996 LA Times, the Clinton administration initially threatened to send the DEA after doctors and dispensers, arguing that medicinal use was a front for full-on legalization. Despite these assertions, studies had already proven marijuana's medical value, and before 1914, few disagreed. For this reason, doctors argued that it was impossible for them to fulfill their oaths if they were forced to refuse medicinal marijuana to a terminally ill patient under the threat of federal prison and loss of medical licensure. Matters changed in 2009 with the election of Barack Obama and the Ogden Memo. The document reversed previous federal policy, noting that if physicians prescribed and dispensaries distributed marijuana in accordance with state law, the DOJ would look the other way. However, in 2011, according to Reason, the Obama administration changed its tune and began raiding dispensaries, even if they were not involved in organized crime. In the end, Congress stepped in to curb DEA activities. The 2015 Robert Carfar Amendment was slotted into that year's Senate Appropriations Bill, 
and passed. Although it did not stop the DEA from engaging in marijuana eradication programs, the amendment stripped the agency of some of its anti-marijuana funding. This meant that the DEA could no longer use funds from states where medicinal marijuana was legal to target registered providers. Today, medical marijuana is legal in most states, and federal government has increasingly adopted a hands-off approach in the face of popular support. Recreational weed, however, was a separate battle that began in earnest in the 70s with the Schaefer Commission. The commission noted that penalties under the 1970 Controlled Substances Act were overly harsh. In turn, according to the Nixon tapes, the Nixon administration was determined to crush the counterculture movement of the 1960s, with whom marijuana smoking had become heavily associated altogether. Richard Nixon viewed the introduction of marijuana to American society as a plot to bring down the country, and even accused Jewish psychiatrists of conspiring to spread cannabis use through the nation's population. In an attempt to produce a more even-keeled approach to marijuana persecution, the commission made several suggestions to the Nixon administration that would render marijuana's legality more similar to alcohol. Nixon ignored all of these requests, and it once again fell to the states to enact change. One might expect that California would have been the first to legalize cannabis, and they did try. 1972's Proposition 19 would have at least decriminalized small amounts of marijuana for personal use, but it was crushed at the ballot box 67% to 33%. Instead, it fell to Oregon, which decriminalized possession and downgraded it to a civil violation in 1973. While getting caught with weed could still result in a fine, these new laws spared the violator prison time and a criminal record. While some feared that decriminalization would lead to an increase in usage, especially among minors, a study by the Connecticut General Assembly revealed that the number of first-time users and arrests fell almost 60% from 1976 to 1990. This statistic proved to many that outright criminalization would not solve the problems the Nixon administration feared. The 2000s and 2010s saw a host of states and municipalities decriminalize the drug. As research by the New York ACLU demonstrated, decriminalization just made sense when considering the consequences of marijuana arrests. According to the New York State page, a criminal conviction for marijuana possession shows up on criminal background checks that can affect future prospects for employment, housing, personal finance, and benefits. The Atlantic noted that although marijuana is used among rich and poor alike, the latter are often slapped with much tougher sentences. For this reason, a teenage act of rebellion can become a barrier to future social mobility and a better life. While there are plenty of discussions to be had over personal responsibility, the statistics have suggested that locking people up is probably not the answer. For this reason, many states have been moving towards legalization in recent years. You know, back in the day, marijuana was a cause. It was a symbol of defiance. Now it's just a commodity. Today, the major question rests upon the overt legalization of marijuana. The movement got its impetus in 2012 when both Washington State and Colorado legalized the drug in violation of federal bans. As of 2023, 20 states and Washington, D.C. have legalized recreational use of marijuana. The drug is increasingly popular, and celebrities and tech moguls like Elon Musk use it openly. Medicinal marijuana was easier for the feds to ignore, since the users were mostly terminally ill patients that otherwise would have suffered. Recreational use, however, was another story. While decriminalization was often local authorities looking the other way on marijuana possession, legalization was a direct nullification of federal bans on marijuana. State-level legalization also raised much discussion about re-evaluating marijuana status as a Schedule I drug. As a result, in 2022, Congress introduced a bill to lift the federal ban and its associated penalties. So what are the arguments for legalization? In an interview with the cannabis magazine High Times, former Republican Congressman Ron Paul argued that legalization is best from a policy and personal freedom perspective. Paul purported that, much like bootlegging in the Prohibition era, the drug war perpetuated cartel violence over the profitable American drug market criminalization created. The retired politician explained that marijuana legalization at the state level law is a pro-freedom compromise that well balances the interests of users and society. Paul argues that legal marijuana will result in a more socially responsible society if accompanied by proper regulation. He believes that Americans have the right to use marijuana, but that individuals should be ready to face consequences if the influence of the drug leads to criminal behavior. In the same way that few argue for outright prohibition when someone receives a DUI conviction, crimes committed by some marijuana users should not impact the drug's legality as a whole. For centuries, marijuana has been used in a whole host of different cultures, but what you may not know is that its modern scientific foundations began in the 19th century just before its worldwide demonization started taking root. Marijuana seemed to be the pop culture drug of the 20th century, from the cannabis hysteria during the Jazz Age and the Great Depression to the rock and roll of the 1960s and 70s, it's not a drug we expect to see in earlier eras. But humanity's use of marijuana, according to the University of Sydney, dates back to at least 2800 BC. 
It was introduced in ancient Greece and Roman society as medicine from Asia. The Roman author and naturalist Pliny the Elder described its use in treating joint pain, gout, upset stomach in animals, and ear infections. However, according to New Scientist, marijuana use in the West was curbed after Pope Innocent VIII condemned it in 1484. But according to a 1998 report by the Select Committee on Science and Technology in the United Kingdom's House of Lords, renewed interest in marijuana grew in the Western world during the 16th century. And by the start of the Victorian era in the early 1800s, the efforts of an Irish doctor were poised to inject marijuana into British medicine in a big way. The Irish physician William Brooke O'Shaughnessy was born in 1808, most likely in Limerick, and studied medicine at Trinity College and the University of Edinburgh. He was unable to get a license to practice medicine in London after graduating, but after setting up his own laboratory, he became noted for his work analyzing the blood and feces of cholera victims. According to new scientists, his work helped end bloodletting as a treatment for cholera patients suffering from dehydration. By 1838, O'Shaughnessy was an assistant surgeon in the Bengal Medical Service of the East India Company. While based in Kolkata, he learned of the recreational and medicinal uses of marijuana, which the native Indians called ganja. And when O'Shaughnessy was introduced to churis, the resin produced from the plant, he thought he had found a viable medicine to experiment with. According to New Scientist, after experimenting on a variety of animals, none of which suffered any harm regardless of the size of the dose, O'Shaughnessy used churis to treat three male patients suffering from rheumatism. At first, the drug only seemed to affect one man, who became excessively chatty and hungry before falling asleep. That same patient later became cataleptic, while another broke into hysterical laughter. But when all three patients claimed to be relieved of pain the following day, O'Shaughnessy discharged them as cured. When he expanded his trials to include other diseases, O'Shaughnessy discovered that marijuana aided in cholera patients' natural recovery and relieved their diarrhea. It also appeared to arrest spasms in tetanus patients, though for rabies patients, it couldn't do much more than ease their passing. O'Shaughnessy was now sufficiently convinced of marijuana's value and published his findings in the Provincial Medical Journal in 1843. Cannabis opened a window into the functioning of our body. When O'Shaughnessy's paper electrified Victorian medical society, he was frequently contacted by his peers in London, eager to learn more. O'Shaughnessy went on to work with the Telegraph in India, for which he was knighted in 1856, and laid the foundations for intravenous therapy. Meanwhile, his work with marijuana placed the drug in pharmacology books throughout Britain and Europe. For the 1998 UK House of Lords report, after marijuana was accepted as a viable medicine by Victorian Britain, it was primarily administered via oral tinctures, an extract dissolved in alcohol. And by the start of the Victorian era in the early 1800s, the efforts of an Irish doctor were posed to inject marijuana into British medicine in a big way. According to Professor James Mills of Gresham College, marijuana was used as a general sedative, an aid in childbirth, a treatment for insanity, and even a treatment for painful menstrual periods. Among those who promoted marijuana's use for menstrual pain was the British physician John Russell Reynolds. According to the journal Advances in Clinical Neuroscience and Rehabilitation, he became a physician to the royal household in 1879. But this appointment has sometimes been misunderstood as Reynolds being Queen Victoria's personal physician. As a result, the book Women in Cannabis, Medicine, Science, and Sociology claimed that during Reynolds' tenure, the Queen routinely took indica to deal with her menstrual pain. But as the House of Lords report noted, there's no proof that Victoria used any marijuana, especially since Victoria was 60 years old by the time Reynolds began working for the royal family. While Victorian society found marijuana a useful treatment for everything from migraines to epilepsy, it wasn't always a reliable medicine. Synthetic pharmacology began to take off in the late 19th century, but the active ingredient in marijuana wasn't discovered until 1964. Raphael Meshulam isolated THC, a psychoactive cannabinoid that makes users feel high. James Mills claims that all medicinal preparations of marijuana in the Victorian era were entirely organic, so the amount of THC in any given batch varied widely. As a result, the drug's effectiveness and side effects couldn't be reliably predicted. But according to the National Museum's Scotland, when Alexander Wood developed the modern hypodermic needle in 1853, it offered improved ways of administering treatments. And since marijuana isn't water-soluble, it was ill-suited for injection. Between such technological innovations and the development of synthetic drugs, marijuana and other herbal remedies gradually fell out of favor. Practical considerations and the drug's own limits drove marijuana's decline toward the end of the Victorian era. It simultaneously gained a sinister reputation in Britain and America. According to James Mills, the Alabad newspaper The Pioneer reported on the growth and sale of marijuana and its effects on mentally ill patients in British-controlled India in 1891. The paper argued that ganja had more harmful effects than opium, pointing to the alleged widespread use of marijuana among asylum patients. 
The pioneer's claims soon attracted attention in the British House of Commons, especially among anti-opium politicians. And while the government's initial policy on marijuana was taxation over prohibition, as more anecdotal reports became widespread in the 1890s, marijuana became a symbol of the evils of British imperialism in the minds of liberal politicians. A commission did carry out a study on marijuana's effects between 1893 and 1894 and found little to no evidence that it was linked to insanity. But the commission did caution that excessive use could damage mental health, without actually defining the word excessive. If you're looking for answers about a religion's take on marijuana, they may be tough to find, but there are clues out there. From the Baha'i faith to Taoism, here's what different religions have to say about weed. Unlike many religions, the Baha'i faith is relatively clear about the acceptable use of marijuana and other derivatives like hashish. It's not allowed. The founder of the faith, the Baha'u'llah, didn't directly address marijuana in the Kitab i Ekdas, which is the Baha'i's most holy book of laws. However, he did talk about a prohibition of drugs like opium, as well as, quote, any substance that induceth sluggishness and torpor, which most Baha'i assume to include marijuana. His successor, Abdul Baha, reiterated that stance and went further to call hashish, quote, the worst of all intoxicants. Maybe I'm high or something, man, I don't... Or maybe you're in the present. Abdul Baha preached that smoking hash would cause the user to struggle to connect with God, making it a poor choice for anyone seeking spiritual enlightenment. After the Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha, their successor, Shoghi Effendi, also argued that marijuana was incompatible with living a just life. Like Abdul Baha, Effendi called out hash as a banned drug, comparing it to substances like peyote or LSD. For the Baha'i, the only exception to the kibosh on marijuana use is if it's prescribed by a doctor. That means that Baha'i followers might be in luck with medical marijuana, but recreational use is certainly a no-go. For Catholics wondering whether their religion is compatible with marijuana, for many years it wasn't easy to know. The Catholic Bible never explicitly talks about marijuana or any of its derivatives, leaving many people to wonder just how Jesus may have felt about the plant if he had any feelings towards it at all. Yet since 1992, when the Catechism of the Catholic Church was finally approved by Pope John Paul II, Catholics have their answer, and it's not pot-friendly. According to paragraph 2291 of the Catechism, the use of any drugs is immoral, and Catholics should abstain from their use. This obviously includes marijuana, with the only exception for therapeutic use. According to some theologians, like Jesuit father Peter Ryan of the Sacred Heart Major Seminary in Detroit, therapeutic use can include medical marijuana if it's properly prescribed. But that's not the opinion of all theologians. For example, Dr. William Chavey argued that the answer isn't so clear-cut and needs to be studied from a medical standpoint to determine the ethical implications. Still, pretty much all Catholic theologians would agree that recreational pot use is completely off the table under any circumstances. This was made abundantly clear in 2014 by Pope Francis, who made a speech at a conference on drug enforcement about his opposition to the legalization of recreational pot. Considering that even drinking coffee or smoking tobacco is expressly prohibited within the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, it should probably come as no surprise that there is a strict embargo on the use of recreational marijuana. Smoking marijuana is considered to be a violation of the Word of Wisdom, which is the health and dietary code many LDS followers live by. As for medical marijuana, things get a little bit trickier. Official church guidance alludes to it being permissible, but only by prescription, and the church's public statements are even less straightforward. In 2018, the LDS Church said that, while it supported the idea of medical marijuana, it was urging its members to vote against Proposition 2, which was the medical marijuana initiative on the ballot. The Church is, does not object to the additional use of marijuana. What is also clear is we do believe Proposition 2 goes too far. But Utah did get medical marijuana in 2018, and the LDS Church actually worked with politicians on the bill. It would be a stretch to say that the LDS Church now supports medical marijuana use, but it's not completely against the idea. That doesn't apply to recreational use, for which there are no exceptions. In retrospect, Hinduism is probably one of the most pro-pot religions out there. 
Unlike many ancient religions, sacred Hindu texts not only mention the use of marijuana, but it actually played an important part in Hindu history. The Atharva Veda considered cannabis a holy plant to be used by anyone looking to purify themselves of sin, sickness, and unhappiness. Even the deity Shiva is said to have used marijuana, which was often consumed in the form of a drink called bang. Due to marijuana's extensive history within Hinduism and India, its use continues to be widespread today. In fact, there is an exception in the Indian national drug laws that allows for cannabis leaves to be sold and consumed as bang, and the government has a hand in regulating its sale around the country. Hindu celebrations like Holi and Shivratri involve copious use of bang among festival goers, but there are actually three different types of Hindu marijuana. Bang is the weakest, charas is the strongest, and ganja sits in the middle. Marijuana has always been an intrinsic part of Hindu culture, and one the faith has embraced wholeheartedly. Sufism is widely known as Islamic mysticism, and while they do worship the Quran, the movement is ascetic and widely distances itself from the rest of the Islamic faith. That includes their feelings on marijuana. Beginning in the 12th century, Sheikh Hadar of the Hadariya order, a prominent Sufi leader, began experimenting with hashish. He was intrigued when he spotted cannabis plants while out walking, and after ingesting it, he recognized its stimulating properties. The use of hashish soon spread amongst the Hadariya Sufis, even as the sheikh told his followers to keep a lid on the magical new secret. But after his death, the word got out, and soon the Hadariya may have been offering marijuana-infused drinks as a substitute for wine, calling it the wine of Hadar. Of all the ways the Sufis use hashish, one of the most popular methods is smoking through a hash pipe, which they call the nafir e vadat or trumpet of unity. Many also combine hash and yogurts in a mix called duge vadat or the drink of unity. Today, some Sufis continue to use hashish, and there are even Sufi shrines where its use is widespread. While the Prophet Muhammad never explicitly mentioned marijuana or hashish in the Quran, it's considered to be an outlawed substance. Muhammad did talk about wine and other intoxicants, which are banned, so most Islamic scholars apply that same reasoning to marijuana and consider it haram or forbidden. Persian and Iraqi Muslims first began using hashish sometime in the late 800s, and by the 1000s it was becoming popular. Nonetheless, Islamic prohibition on cannabis began as early as the 13th century, when the Mamluk Sultan Baybars I made its use punishable by death. Today, many Middle Eastern countries under Islamic law continue to have extremely severe policies restricting the use of marijuana. The only exception, according to some Islamic scholars, is medicinal marijuana. In 2018, the Fiqh Council of North America issued a statement on medical marijuana saying that it was permissible with caveats. Generally, marijuana-infused medications are allowed, but only if they don't get the user stoned. At the same time, citing the Hanafi and Shafi'i schools of Islamic law, the Fiqh Council suggested that some level of intoxication is okay, but only if there's no alternative and the medicine is proven to work. So, Muslims can use marijuana, they just can't get high. How do you do that? According to some interpretations, ancient Jewish scriptures like the Talmud and Hebrew Bible actually reference the cannabis plant. Moreover, many Jewish communities have used marijuana for religious and medical purposes dating back thousands of years. There's even evidence that the ancient Israelites living in the Kingdom of Judah and worshipping at the First Temple of Jerusalem consumed marijuana as part of their religious rituals. Furthermore, while they're not all in agreement, many rabbis consider marijuana to be kosher. In 2013, an Israeli rabbi argued that as long as it was being smoked and not eaten, all marijuana was kosher. That opinion was modified by a different rabbi, who claimed that only medical marijuana was kosher. In January 2016, OU Kosher, one of the biggest purveyors of kosher products worldwide, began certifying some medical marijuana products. Some interpretations hold that marijuana is part of a group of foods known as kidneyat that are banned among Ashkenazi Jews on Passover. But a ruling in 2016 by a respected ultra-Orthodox rabbi claimed medical marijuana was exempted from the prohibition 
and allowed to be used or eaten. I'm just going to write a prescription for you for two huge bags of weed. In Israel, recreational marijuana has long been illegal. But medical marijuana was legalized in the 1990s. Generally, rabbis hold that medicinal use is okay, especially if it is used for pain reduction, while recreational use isn't. Of all the modern religions today, Rastafarianism probably has the closest connection to marijuana. For Rastas, marijuana, which they often refer to as ganja, is one of the most important herbs on the planet. They interpret the Bible as referencing marijuana multiple times, and many Rastas see smoking ganja as akin to taking the Christian Eucharist. Rastas don't just smoke marijuana, though. They also cook with it and use it as medicine. The use of marijuana among the Rastafari is highly spiritual, and they believe it helps cleanse and clear the mind. It's thought that marijuana was introduced to Rastas in the 19th century by Hindu Indian laborers who used ganja as part of their own religious worship. Within Rastafarianism, marijuana is revered because of its ability to encourage and stimulate peace and togetherness in the community, and they often use it for meditation. They believe it helps reveal one's inner self, and smoking is often done in a large group setting. Sometimes they'll say a prayer while preparing the marijuana to be smoked. And the most popular ways of smoking are as a marijuana cigar or through a water pipe, known as a chalice, chillum, or steamer. After smoking, practitioners typically engage in reasoning sessions, where they attempt to reach higher mental clarity together through conversation. For Rastas, marijuana is no joke. It's a sacrament rather than a recreational drug. Taoism and marijuana have been linked for thousands of years. At first, the Taoists are thought to have rejected the cannabis plant when they came into contact with it in 600 BC. But for whatever reason, that appears to have changed about seven centuries later, and by AD 100, they had apparently discovered its psychoactive properties. It's unclear exactly how they used marijuana, which may have brought on hallucinations, as ancient literature points to them ingesting cannabis seeds, which are notoriously low in THC. In order to be high enough to have hallucinations, they would have needed to get a lot of THC into their systems, which they likely couldn't have done by eating seeds alone. This suggests they may have found a way to smoke or otherwise ingest the marijuana. Don't worry, it'll just give us trippier visuals. <sighs> Buckle up, buttercup. There is also something of a cannabis deity among Taoists known as Magu. Magu, which can be translated as hemp, is identified among ancient Taoist texts with the cannabis plant's healing properties, as well as Mount Tai in China, where it's reported that a lot of cannabis plants naturally grow. It's unclear how many religions have cannabis deities, but Magu is most likely unique in that respect, as she certainly adds to the Taoist cannabis intrigue. While most Sikhs don't partake, marijuana is prevalent within the Nihang Sikh community. The Nihangs, or the Immortals, are a group of Sikh warriors who helped fight off invaders from Afghanistan and the Mughal Empire. According to the Tribune India, the Nihangs started using marijuana for medicinal and therapeutic purposes while they were fighting. It helped them heal from injuries, likely by reducing pain, and calmed warriors heading into battle. The Nihangs call their marijuana concoction bang, or sukkah, and it consists of cannabis leaves that are eaten. However, the Nihangs haven't fought a battle for almost 175 years, so their continued use of marijuana is controversial. Furthermore, the official Sikh Code of Conduct, or Sikh Rihat Maryada, bans marijuana use because it's intoxicating, and the founder of Sikhism, Guru Nanak, counseled against using substances like marijuana. With these new restrictions, marijuana and Sikhism might be headed for a permanent split, but only time will tell. The cult of Santa Muerte is one of the most mysterious and misunderstood in modern times, but what is widely known is its close relationship with marijuana. The cult dates back centuries, but only recently has it become popular, largely due to its association with narcos. It began in jails with prisoners, and especially prisoners uh, related to drug dealers. There are no specific sacred Santa Muerte religious texts that talk about marijuana, but there are many temples and shrines, and plenty of them are connected with pot. 
Not all followers of Santa Muerte consume marijuana, but those who do are known for using it to interact with the deity. Often, they will pray to Santa Muerte and blow marijuana smoke on a shrine to ensure the prayer will come true. In addition to marijuana, alcohol and other narcotics are also used by worshippers to connect with the deity. Not all Santa Muerte followers use intoxicants, but for many, the two are divinely linked. Buddhism has been pretty clear that marijuana use, at least for recreational purposes, is forbidden. The five precepts of Buddhism serve as a moral guide for how a Buddhist should live their life. The fifth of the precepts says that one should refrain from intoxicants that cloud the mind. Contemporary Buddhist leaders continue to ban marijuana use. In a 2014 interview with Time, the Dalai Lama was vehemently against the use of marijuana for recreational purposes, calling it poison. He did express some acceptance of its use on medical grounds, but also suggested that it could lead to brain damage, though he may have been referencing spiritual, not physical matters. Yeah, it doesn't really sound to me like the Dalai Lama is, you know, a big stoner, or maybe he's just pretending. <laughs> in 2022, the National Office of Buddhism in Thailand prohibited Buddhist monks from using marijuana, even though the country had just made it legal. Likewise, monks aren't allowed to grow marijuana at their temples or monasteries, and can only use it with a doctor's prescription. What do you do for fun? Use drugs. <laughs> Shinto priests and followers have been using marijuana for a long time for its purifying abilities. Priests are said to have used marijuana to ward off evil spirits, often by waving it in the air, though it's unclear whether the weed is lit while they're doing this. Historically, it's played a role in weddings, as brides apparently wore cannabis veils during the ceremonies. The Issei Jingu Shrine, which is one of the most important Shinto destinations in Japan, references marijuana through annual ceremonies known as the Taima, which means cannabis in Japanese. The Issei Jingu is located in the Mie Prefecture, where a group known as the Shinto Association operates. In 2018, they got a license to grow low-THC hemp. They can now grow cannabis for two shrines in the prefecture, neither of which is the Issei Jingu and they use it in spiritual rituals. The Brazilian region of Santo Daime is relatively new, and its connection with marijuana runs deep. Santo Daime first sprung up in the early 1900s after being founded by a man named Raimundo Irene Ocera. It combines elements ranging from folk Catholicism to Indian shamanism. While much of the religion is based around the use of the psychedelic concoction known as ayahuasca, which is what Santo Daime means, marijuana is also used as a spiritual guide, but only for followers known as daimistas. Daimistas refer to cannabis as Santa Maria, but only one group of them are known to use it widely. In the 1970s, daimistas, under Padria Sebastayo, who was a friend of Sarah's before his 1971 death, split off from the larger Santo Daime sect and began using marijuana in religious ceremonies in order to have deeper, more spiritual visions. However, among the rest of Santo Daime's followers, marijuana is viewed as a drug. That makes Sebastayo's group outsiders, and their affinity for marijuana remains polarizing among Santo Daime worshippers. Zoroastrianism is one of the world's oldest religions, and evidence suggests marijuana played a role in many ancient Zoroastrian practices. The Zendavesta, which is the most sacred book of Zoroastrianism, talks about marijuana in the volume known as the Vendidad. The Vendidad refers to cannabis as bang, a common name for the drug in Asia, and explicitly refers to it as a, quote, good narcotic. Calling it a narcotic implies that Zoroastrians were using it for psychoactive purposes, but that's not definitive. How do you feel? Like a slice of butter melting on top of a big old pile of flapjacks. Outside of scriptural references, it's thought that Zoroastrians may have incorporated marijuana into burial rituals and used it for spiritual purposes. The latter would again point to them having knowledge of its psychoactive effects, but that's just speculation. For members of the Aklavwa Native American Church, or ONAC, cannabis isn't just a drug, it's an important sacrament. ONAC is a Native American religious tradition that uses natural substances like cannabis, psilocybin or hallucinogenic mushrooms, ayahuasca, and peyote in order to gain higher spiritual enlightenment. 
The founders of the church hold ceremonies where they use marijuana as a medicine, including pipe ceremonies where the medicine is smoked. They are one of the few American groups for whom it's legal to do so. The Onac is a federally recognized and registered Native American tribe that's exempted from laws that make marijuana federally illegal. Many members have official government ID cards that give them a license to carry plants and other natural substances that would otherwise be deemed against the law. According to their official guidelines, members are allowed to have up to two ounces of marijuana for personal use, and they even have a specific guide on how to cultivate it. However, that hasn't stopped the police from arresting some ONAC members on drug charges, even if law enforcement's record of victories in the area is murky. Still, ONAC remains committed to using marijuana as a spiritual and medical sacrament, regardless of the legal risk.